All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our final webinar of the day. It looks like most of those attending have, have attended other webinars in the past, so you know in the past today. So you know my name is Rosie, and I am your host for today. And you have joined, um, arrived at the session, Confessions of a Nature Photographer Part 2. So this is uh, will be uh, led by Brian Scholes, and he did a webinar with us last year, uh, which I believe was called part one. And this will be a follow up of that. Um, so we're happy to welcome Brian Scholes. He's a nature photographer. Um, his interest in photography started with a, is it pronounced a Zeiss icon or a Zeus icon? Yes, okay. Um, from his parents on his 15th birthday. So after many years of uh, photographing landscapes, nature, and people, he began, he stumbled into the world of bird photography, um, and he's currently working on a photograph of um, birds from various countries in the world. And I believe he's going to show us some photographs of birds today, but also other Ontario wildlife. And without further ado, I will pass it on to Brian. Welcome, Brian. Well, hello. Am I being heard? Yes. Okay. I see nodding. Okay. Well, <laughs> Monica, first of all, I must thank the Wintergreen staff for organizing this again. Who would have thought that two years in a row, we would have to have it online and virtual. That is just so disappointing and surprising, but here we are. So I thank Rosie and, and uh, Monica and Rena for going to the trouble and for the other speakers who have come forward and, uh, then it online. It doesn't have the same feel when you're doing it online. I don't even know if anybody's out there apart from uh, Rosie, Monica, and, and Rena. I could be talking to just the three of us. I have no idea. But I didn't check the, the attendance uh, last year because I didn't want to see anybody leaving. <laughs> so, so I had no idea who came and I had no idea who left. I just went ahead and I felt like a disc jockey just talking to the air, whoever's out there. So well, last Brian, year, we do have some participants. There are 10 people in attendance. <laughs> so okay, well, hello to the worry. 10 of you. And, yes. And I don't know your level, I don't know whether you're children, whether you're experienced professional uh, photographers, I have no idea, but that's fine. I have pre prepared something uh, and I'm building on what I did last year. Last year, the focus was on uh, birds. And this year we decided to uh, do something a little bit different. And so I focused on mammals, having no idea what I had agreed to and did not realize how much different it is photographing animals than birds. And I have, I'll talk a little bit about that it was a bit of a challenge to come up with a kind of enough photographs. I real I didn't realize how few animal photographs I have, and I know why, but I'll, we can talk about that. So I, I was a teacher, so as a good teacher, I will start with a review from part one. Uh, the way I did it last year was, uh, and I'm gonna move you guys over to here and hope I don't, so I, I did the start, uh, start sharing my screen, right? Um, now, yes, please. Here? That is how we will see. see oh, <laughs> we just practice this and now I don't see it. Um, Should be on the bottom in yeah, green. I, maybe I have to make you wider or something. Oh, there we go. I had it too narrow. Okay. Share screen. And if I click on this one, do you see uh, my screen with a little blue bird in the middle? Yes, we see it. Yes. Okay. So I will start. Uh, it's, it's really, it's more of a slideshow. I made it into a video, but I didn't really add much video and I can explain about that as well. Um, so they're just time for 10 seconds. So I will, I'll, I'll be able to fill in 10 seconds easily on them. Um, and I may have to stop it from time to time. So let me see if it'll respond to the space bar. Okay. I can't really tell. Yes, I can. Okay. So what I've, the way I did it last year, and I'm going to start this way is, uh, I kind of tried to show the progression of how I started and how I am where I am now. So uh, maybe a dozen years or so ago, I bought what I thought was a really good camera outfit, having no idea how to use it. And this is my first bird photograph. As you can see, if you look carefully, a little blue bird in the middle. Um, so, and then I took a, a well, and I bought it, it was, this, is, this is with a 200 millimeter lens that I thought was a big deal then. Um, and then I took another one and you can see if you look in the sort of top leftish corner, a little white spot, that's the head of a, of a bald eagle. That's what I started with a dozen years ago. And then I thought, well, I'll just zoom in and then I'll have the photographs. 
well, that's what happens when you zoom in on that bluebird. You don't, you don't get much better. And then I tried the same thing on the, uh, on the bald eagle, and that's what I was at. So I started with that quite a few years ago. Uh, camera cost probably $1,000 back then, and the lens was maybe as much. And this is sort of where I am now. Um, so that's an improvement on the bald eagle for sure. And now I have different equipment, which has been the, one of the biggest changes. Uh, here's a local uh, uh, hooded meganser that, that uh, I took a picture of with, with my new equipment, obviously. Uh, here are some peregrine falcons uh, that, again, so now I'm using entirely different equipment and probably a, a different approach. Um, I'm much, now, so I'm gonna pause it here for a second. So now I'm going to do the same thing with the with the animal photography, and this is where it begins the story of why is it that much harder. Um, so here here is a, a small collection of early, uh, not particularly good photographs. In the bottom left hand corner is a wolf. That's the only picture I got of it. Um, and then we have going from that wolf. So the the photographs that I'm going to be showing are primarily animals that you would find in Ontario, in Eastern Ontario. Not all of the photographs that I took, uh, that I'm showing were taken in Ontario, but they are of animals from Ontario, with a few exceptions, and I'll explain why I've included those. So here is a, a bear. Uh, oh, I was saying that the, there are a few photographs included that are not, uh, that are not from local Ant uh, Eastern Ontario. The ones that I have uh, are animals you would find here, but they may not have, they may not have been taken here. Okay, so we get that running again. So here's a picture of a bear. Again, uh, not a particularly good picture, quite a distance. Here are some coyotes. These were actually taken uh, in, uh, in Alberta. Again, quite a ways away. Um, a deer, which is, this is not so bad a photograph for me in a sense that I like it when I can see the surroundings as well. Um, but again, it's, uh, that is of a red fox uh, at the boat museum downtown Kingston. Uh, oh, wow. Bit grainy and in the middle of you know in the middle of the photograph, but it's there. Um, here's uh, was this was a surprise to me. I'd never seen a bear climb a tree before, and they climb trees like they like we would climb a set of stairs. I had no idea they were that nimble, and very high. So now we're, these are these are sort of the new and improved ones. Again, different equipment, different approach. Uh, this is a, a caribou from Newfoundland. Um, we will not see those around Ontario. So here's a better picture of a bear. That one, again, photographing some animals is a little bit precarious, bears in particular. I think at that point, she had sensed, I think she had sensed me and was realized that there was something out there. She had a couple of cubs. So I was being careful to keep my distance, but as a photographer, it's really hard to resist when something like that comes along. So I, I took a couple more pictures and then thought, okay, that's that's enough. Um, but well, you have to fight the temptation to want to get you know better and better. Um, here's from uh, Cataraqui Conservation Area. It, the beaver, we are known for the beaver. They are not that easy to find, and they are not that easy to find doing anything interesting. So one of the things uh, for anybody who's thinking of starting uh, uh, nature photography, any photography is in, in a sense, ask yourself, why do you want to do it? What's, what's, what's the motivation? Is it to be a hobby? Do you want to be creative? Are you looking for a reason to get outside, learn new things? And then on top of that, especially when it comes to gear is what do you plan to do with your photographs? Uh, if all you want to do is share them on the internet, then you can get away with, with less, less expensive equipment. If you want to make money, well, then you're looking at probably $10,000 to have the kind of equipment that you're up against uh, as, as competitive photographers. Um, if you, you might want to make fr framed wall prints, that's been on my list of things to do since I started and I still don't have any up, not of mine. Um, publish in magazines, I never have. I do subscribe to a magazine and I don't know that I want to do that, but it's, uh, it's a possibility. Uh, create books. That's one of my uh, goals is I, I made one little book last year just to get myself started. And I would like to try and not make a, not make a, a fortune off it, but enough to at least have a, have a sort of a goal to, to get towards. Um, posters, I made this poster quite a few years ago of uh, I think it's about 66 birds that I took photographs in Nigeria. And I plan to make a few more of these. It's one, it's one way to kind of organize your work to see it. Um, and then 
the other the other thing that I last year I had three goals with my photography. One I had to do something with it, and I had three goals. One was to do something, anything with it um, that related to what I already have. And the Bio Blitz presentation was my first goal in the sense that I I did it. I finally got my photographs in front of other people besides me and my hard drive. Uh, the other the other thing that I did was I made a calendar, and I gave it to uh, friends and family, and it was really a fun process um, and it was has been very well received so that I will certainly I will certainly do it again people are trying to convince me I should do one to sell and I maybe I will maybe I won't uh, I included this one it's not a it's not a, a calendar of animal photographs uh, it's just a calendar of what I thought were interesting photographs that I've taken over the years I included this one in this presentation because it's of an animal in uh, Brazil that we, uh, we went looking for an anteater and actually found one um, so that's kind of where I am with mine. And the other, the last of the three things I did last, last year was um, to take, I had, I had made an electronic book and I decided I wanted to see it in print. So I made a print uh, of a copy, one copy of the book just to see what it looked and felt like. And this was, that's the cover. And this is just a one page inside. So I've been working on that, and that is maybe some point, at some point something I would sell. People aren't encouraging me to, but I'm very kind of, uh, I don't know what it is. I overthink things, to put it that way. Um, I don't want to have a garage full of books I've printed with nobody to buy them. So what do you need to take photographs? Well, you need camera gear. Uh, you need three things. Camera gear is one. And here's the, this is the gear I have right now. It's, it's kind of due for an update. Um, the top right hand corner is what I take most of my photographs with now. It's big and it's heavy. The whole thing now with the mirrorless cameras is available uh, more expensive, but probably one third the weight, maybe third to a half the weight. Next to that on the left hand side is a microphone that is really, really good for uh, when you're, certainly when you're photographing birds. And then further to the left is uh, one of the two cameras I have. And then a couple other lenses below. The one in the dead center is the one I started with, with that picture of the bluebird, which is good for uh, when subjects are probably, um, I don't know, a few car lengths away, not very far. The bottom left one with the green strap on it, that is an amazing camera to get started with. Um, the top one, the other ones are sort of in the two to $3,000 range. Uh, with the lenses. Um, the bottom left one, I think, is about $800, and it takes amazing photographs. It's made of plastic, so it's not quite as durable, and the resolution, if you enlarge the photographs, is not quite as good, um, but it takes really good photographs, and the zoom is, is something else. It's a 60 times zoom, uh, which makes it uh, longer than the one at the top right. So that's that my, my gear. Then you also need, uh, once you've got the gear, you need light and I threw this in because it's a nice picture of light but also because another viable camera is a phone. Uh, the phones are getting better and better and I just paid a ridiculous amount of money for a new phone and the only way I could justify it was because I said I'm buying a camera not a phone. So I bought an iPhone 12 um, at $1,600 I think it was something like that but the, but the quality of the photographs is, is just amazing. Uh, you can't zoom in very far, it's two and a half time zoom, but you can still get some really good pictures, especially if you want to do close-ups, insects, flowers and things. But for mammals, well, you, you could get some good, uh, good, good scenery shots. Um, so you, so you, need, you need camera gear, you need light, and you need a subject. So here's our North American porcupine, very willing subject in this case. And I I try to shoot a, a variety of things, but as I said earlier, I like to try and include some of the environment. So I like the fact that the trees are there, um, that not just, there's a tendency to want to always do a close up like that of a moose. That moose is in Newfoundland, um, but I had no choice. I didn't have a zoom lens. All I had was a, was a 300 millimeter lens and the thing was almost on the trail and I couldn't get back far enough. And that was all I could get in. It was just its, just its eyeball in its mouth. And the other thing that you will need is, is uh, something to, to uh, process the, the photographs with after, which again, could be a phone. There's a lot of apps on phones now, so you don't necessarily need to have a, an expensive laptop. This is my setup right now. Um, but for me, it's a 
kind of a serious hobby, so it's I, I don't mind justifying the expense of it. Um, but you can also do it on a laptop. You can do it on a on a tablet or a phone, or in this case, I have a computer with a second monitor. And then I have a whole bunch of hard drives to uh, to back everything up. I'm a bit of a okay now. So then we get to the question of uh, how is photographing animals different than birds? And one of this is not my photograph. This is from a friend of a friend of mine. Uh, it's a picture of a fisher that was taken at uh, Charleston Lake. And one of the the biggest difference between photographing animals and birds is that animals are just hard to find. There aren't that many species in the first place, and they're hard to find. This, I think, I think Jim has been in the bush for I don't know how many, but maybe 30 years or more. This is the first time he's ever seen a fisher, um, and that was only that was only seen because my partner Lana uh, was the one who see it. She's my guide. Um, so, so I've been back to Charleston Lake, but I, just on the off chance that it comes back, but I haven't seen it. I, so that's the first, the first, uh, the first challenge with animals is finding them. So that's a picture of a fisher that I say is not mine, but that Jim was uh, kind enough to let me include it in the presentation. When I put that up, do you see, do you see the little timer coming up when I do that? Can somebody nod or I guess I can, I'll never know. Okay. Um, the, other, the other challenge, and partly related to the fact that there's not that many of them, is they need more territory. So there are fewer of them in any given area. If you go to Cataraqui Conservation Area, you'll see a bird of some kind. And if the not when you're looking for, you'll see something. There will be birds there. You may or may not see one of the resident animals, uh, and there aren't that many. It's a small it's a small park. It doesn't sustain very many of them. So if the one that is there is not there when you are, then you're out of luck. But for birds, they there will be more there. They they, they the density is higher for sure. Um, so this was taken in Westport uh, just recently. The other challenge you have with, with animals, and this one's this is a bad example, but the previous example is it was easy to find because it's black on white. But they un, unlike unlike birds that can be colorful, move a lot, they're hard to find. So this is just a, a squirrel. Um, and I don't know what kind of a squirrel is. I thought there were I thought there was a red squirrel, a least something squirrel, and a and a gray squirrel. And I was doing some digging around. And apparently Canada hosts 22 different species of squirrels. So I don't know how to tell them apart yet. I didn't even know there were that many. So this one doesn't look like a red squirrel, doesn't look like a gray squirrel. Uh, so I don't know what it is, but it's a squirrel. Uh, and I threw it in there because they're well camouflaged. So even if there are animals there, the chances of you seeing them compared to say a scarlet tanager or uh, some other bright, you know, blue jay or a cardinal, they, they don't have bright colors. So even if they're there, you might not see them. And they don't move very much and they don't move quickly and, until they're ready to move. So I don't know how many times I have been startled by a squirrel or a chipmunk that was right there. And until it moved, I didn't see it. So those are the challenges. They, there are fewer of them. They need more territory. So in any given area, there aren't very many. They don't have bright, they don't have bright colors. And they're camouflaged. And one more that I'll add to it. Well, I have a couple more. I guess 10 seconds for slides is too long, right? Last time it was too short. Um, okay, well, I, I, I'm missing a picture, but I had a, I had a picture of a rabbit. I thought I did. Um, and rabbits, don't, they don't make any sounds. Animals very seldom make any sounds. So birds give themselves away, especially during nesting. They're, they're talking to each other and uh, driving other, other, uh, other uh, competitors off. So birds make noise and give themselves away. Animals don't. I think I'm missing a couple of photographs here, but that's okay. Um, let's just see. Okay, so there's the rabbit. So I do have a rabbit. So Robbie, as you know, of course, rabbits don't make any noise. So unless you see them move, uh, and if they're in anything brown, you probably won't see them. And the other, and the last of the, uh, oh, there's one more, is that if they they seldom stick around, they leave quickly, and they typically don't come back. A bird will often come back to the same perch. A flycatcher will just go away, come back to exactly the same branch time and time again. But if an animal is startled, um, they go and they seek cover and they don't come back to see how you're doing. 
they're not in, they're not that a deer might look over its shoulder a moose might but they're and a bear might look up but they typically are not interested in hanging around um so what that means as a photographer is you might only get one chance to get a picture before it's gone um, and getting video is even harder because to get good video, you need to be on a tripod, but you don't have time to set up a tripod for most, a lot of animals. I mean, clearly, sometimes you get lucky, but uh, so, so those are the reasons that I, that I realized that, um, that photographing animals is harder than photographing birds. And on top of that, some of the animals are nocturnal. Uh, I don't have a picture of a skunk. I have a picture of a roadkill skunk, but that doesn't count. Um, so uh, skunks are out at night, raccoons are out at night, a lot of them are. So we're not out at night, and even if you were, you'd have to have specialized equipment to photograph them. So there are several reasons why photographing animals is that much harder than photographing birds. Um, so this, okay, there's another, just another example of, of a subject. And a, this is a nocturnal, so raccoons are nocturnal. So, and they're also daytime, but, uh, but they do a lot of roaming at night. So then how can you find animals to photograph? Many, if not most photographs of animals you'll see in a magazine were taken on guided trips that are very expensive um, and the guides are being paid well so they know how to find the animals. They know where they are, that's, that's what it comes down to. You might never find one on your own. Even that's true in Eastern Ontario. I don't know that I could take you to find a picture of even of a muskrat. I, I know where I would go and look, but I don't know that I could ever find one for you. Uh, unless one was was unless I knew where a den was or something or a beaver lodge, but so that I threw this in because it's uh, we have not been on very many guided trips. Um, for us, we get as much enjoyment out of finding things ourselves. But there are a lot of places that you can't do it, and, there's, and there are places where it's dangerous. This was taken in India. Um, we haven't been on any expensive safaris. This was a great safari because it was a dollar. <laughs> they had a bus that drove through a park with about twenty people on it, and they drive around and around and around looking for anything looking for tigers primarily. And they found a family of tigers. Uh, we went out, I think, seven times. It was like an, maybe 45 minute or an hour drive, but for a dollar a pop, it was worth it. And we actually ended up seeing one. So, so guided tours are one way to be sure of, or to increase your chances of seeing, of seeing animals. Um, I may, I may have to hurry these along. Okay, another, another place to, to see animals is in uh, rescue centers. And this, is, this was taken at the Kirkland Eco Museum outside Montreal that has a collection of animals that would not, that would not uh, survive on their own. So this is not an Eastern Ontario animal, it's an Arctic fox, it's blind. So, so, but it's a great place to go to learn your equipment. Here's a timber wolf. I don't know why he was there, or sorry, a gray wolf. I've, but uh, finding those in the wild is not easy and getting close enough to photograph. Here's a, an otter uh, also at the, at the uh, uh, Kirkland Museum. So captive animals are a good place to, to go and practice. Um, here's a, a, I've never been that close to a beaver. That's at the uh, Montreal Biodome, which is a great place to go and see Canadian wildlife. It's a wonderful museum. Um, and this is one of my one of my goals or dreams is to photograph a lynx in the wild. This was taken at uh, at the Montreal uh, Biodome as well. And ethically, I don't think any any photographer worth its salt would ever take a, a captive photograph and not say it, say it was so. Um, so so to, you can either go on a guided trip, you can go to to see captive animals, uh, or you can go looking yourself. I have a, a bit of an edge because uh, my my partner Lana is a very serious birder. And I think probably 80% of my photographs are due to her finding them. I just don't see the things she sees. Um, so she finds even the animals, I don't see them until she points them out. Even then I have a hard time seeing them. So without, without Lana, I would have a very, very small um, nature photography collection other than flowers and things that don't run away. So I have a bit of an advantage because I, have a, I live with a, well, she could be a guide. Um, so I have somebody who uh, who is able to help me find things that I would not find on my own. Uh, one way to get around that is you don't have your own guide in the house is to uh, join join clubs or watch when people are going out on outings. Different different organizations around do uh, do guided tours for, for locals. Um, I'm not going to go into detail on this, but clearly if you are going to go looking for animals to photograph them or at all, it I think it's become fairly common practice now 
to exercise uh, decent ethical uh, behavior. Basically, leave them alone. There is no photograph worth disturbing an animal at all. Baiting animals is, for me, is completely outrageous. I don't know why anybody would want to attract an animal by giving it food, bringing it to the highway. So, and, there, and uh, this is the Nature Photographers Network Code of Ethics. Most organizations have codes of ethics, and it, it's fairly it's fairly simple. Just don't bother them. Don't do anything that would disturb them just to get a photograph. Just enjoy looking at them if you can't get close enough or get a bigger lens or do something. Think about it uh, before you start uh, bothering them to the point that it interferes with their with their uh, breeding. And a lot of them are drawn to the, to the roadside and they end up being roadkill. So you have to give some uh, some credit. You're going into their you're going into their territory. So you have to kind of respect that and uh, and just hold off on the on the uh, getting too close. Uh, doing research to know what's around you. Most parks have, have lists of what's in the park, so that can be helpful. Um, this is a list of what is considered to be in Eastern Ontario. The ones highlighted in blue are ones that I have photographs of. Not necessarily good photographs, but at least I have photographs of those. The ones in the bottom left with stars uh, the two yellow ones are ones you've seen on my uh, the, earlier, the lynx and the arctic fox. They are in captivity, so I don't count them as my photographs in the sense of, of natural uh, nature photography. The bobcat, badger, cougar, and wolverine, they come up on different lists as having been seen or reported to have been seen in northern, maybe in Algonquin, but uh, I've never seen any of those. And there's still, people are still debating whether those who think they've seen them have actually seen them um, in this area. So that's what there is to see. Uh, the bottom right hand corner where there are no blue, they're all little creatures that, uh, that I don't even know. I've seen mice and I've seen things scurry down holes, but I don't, I've never tried to photograph a shrew or a mouse or a vole or any of those guys or a bat, um, but they're out there. And the ones that I might get one day are the striped skunk, the ermine, the fisher and the marten. Uh, other than that, if I knew what at least chipmunk was, I might be able to photograph one of those. Um, and to get in any of those, you'd have to go uh, north to see any of the, uh, the other ones, I think. Bobcat and badger. Um, I like photographs that show the environment. And the environment can be any number of things. Um, I could do a close up on the deer in the bottom left hand corner. You'd have no idea where it was. You wouldn't know if it was in a zoo or not. These, I believe, are mule deer taken in, uh, in Alberta. But the, the, it makes for an interesting photograph. Um, I had another one of the same bunch, but I didn't include it, of them standing at the train tracks. Um, and that just creates a different, it's a different feeling. Uh, here they are in the Hoodoo area. So again, these are not from Eastern Ontario, but I'm trying to get across the idea that, that it doesn't have to be a close up to make an interesting photograph. I put this one in, um, in terms of finding them. So I've learned from, from really from Lana, um, what she does to, to try and find mostly birds. And it starts for her, it starts with sound. She hears something typically, and a bird or a sound she doesn't recognize. Uh, that's not much help for an animal, except for it might rustle the grass if it's, if it's moving in the, in the leaves. Um, and then she looks for movement and that is very helpful. Animals will give themselves away by moving. And then she also uh, walks very quietly. And it's, it's a challenge. If there's one other person, we're such social creatures, we want to talk all the time. And that's all the clue that animals need to, uh, to move on. So I put this one in because it's an example of ways to think about it. So when you're coming to a clearing like this, that bridge is crossing water. There's a reasonable chance that there is something at the water. Uh, and actually there was, it was a muskrat there. So anytime that you're walking on a trail and coming to a clearing, stop before you, before you present yourself to whoever's out there. Um, stop, go really, really slowly and look around and there may be something there. If there is, you probably want to, uh, I've obviously advanced really, really slowly, but crouch down, um, try and blend in as best you can. And if you make any kind of noise, typically that's if you step on a twig, sometimes that's all it takes. Um, and of course, the obvious risks in photographing uh, uh, some animals, bears in particular. I don't know whether any other animals that we have that would be, that would be uh, a problem. Um, so I'm going to talk just, so, just some, uh, some, some advice. These are otters taken uh, in the Tay River by, by Perth, um, interesting creatures. 
Um, and I only just learned that the way that I can't tell a, 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 a otter, no, a, a muskrat from a beaver in the water. I still don't know what the facial features are. And yeah, that's all, often all you see. You need to see the tail. And the otter sometimes can be mixed in there as well. But the otter, its tail, they, they, they kind of, when they, when they go under, they, they arc their tail out. So they kind of give themselves away. Here's another example of a, of a photograph, uh, including some environment. It doesn't have to be a full body. This one I tried, what if you, what if you made it square as opposed to uh, portrait or, or landscape? Just different. I cut off half the animal. Uh, what if you did a portrait? So it's, up, so it's uh, longer than it is wide. Uh, this one kind of lends itself to that. It's a raccoon. I think most people will know the animals that I'm showing. Um, one tip that I've learned the hard way is set the camera up before you leave the house and take a test shot. Don't just sort of, okay, I'm all ready to go and open the thing and make sure there's a camera, there's a battery in there. Take a test shot because there might not be a card. The battery might be in there, but dead. So it's, it's, it's important to, uh, and as I say, you don't get much chance when you're out in the field to make many adjustments. Uh, so you need to be ready. Uh, I would advise, if you know what it means, to, sh to shoot RAW and JPEG. The RAW file is much bigger, but it allows you to do much better processing after. Certainly carry an extra charge battery, an extra camera card. Make sure that the card is not full. Uh, carry a charged phone uh, for safety reasons, for one thing. And the, G the uh, cameras will give you GPS coordinates. So I try and make sure I take a photograph with my camera as well as my, with my phone, rather, so that I have a, a, a record of where I took the photograph. So when I come back, I can, I can see it on the map and I can go back to the same place. Um, for video, a tripod or a monopod is pretty much required. Um, very few photographers are using tripods these days with the, with the new uh, resolution or the new uh, um, stability features in the cameras. Um, this one, I thought that the, I didn't realize until, but I thought the fox had, had some kind of a kill. I thought it got something, but it's a, it's a worker's glove. <laughs> and yet, so you never, that's not, you never know what's out there. You never know what you're going to see. Um, Lana was not looking for a fisher that day, right? She had no idea it was there. Um, and then a little bit of kind of emergency first aid kit, a flashlight, something to wear so that you're comfortable. So you may have, you may have to stand for, for hours. I mean, I've stood for quite a while. Um, and you have to prepare in Canada, especially now in this area for ticks that are a huge problem. So ticks, bugs uh, in general, uh, black flies. Uh, wearing camo gear is not a bad idea. Uh, if you wear white or yellow you will, or red, you will be seen for miles away. Uh, animals are very sensitive to a color that doesn't belong where they are. Uh, sunscreen, a reasonable hat, those kinds of things. And I insure all my camera gear, so I don't worry about it. If it gets stolen or if it, I even insure it against breakage now. So if I don't, I don't worry about it. If I drop it, I, I pay an insurance and, I, and they'll replace it. Uh, here's our friendly groundhog taken in a cemetery. Uh, I didn't have the, I, I do have other shots of with the environment, which is again, adds a little bit to it. Um, we're at 41 minutes. I think we're close to the end. Um, Fox kits playing on uh, Pinnacon Road. That was taken from the car. That's another little tip is shooting from the car. If you see something on the road, it, it's not as likely to move from the, because of the car. But as soon as you open the door, whatever it is, is likely to go. So, and they sell bean bags to wind your window, so you can wind your window down. Um, here's an example of kind of the fleeting, the fleetingness of, uh, of animal photography. This was at uh, Con uh, Cataraqui Conservation Area early in the morning. This deer walked for about probably 40 seconds. I happened to be set up with my tripod to shoot. Uh, I, was, I was shooting a song sparrow and I caught this out of the corner of my eye, but it was there and gone. Less, it was 30 seconds probably. It walked across there and it was back and then it, was, then it disappeared again. Um, so yeah, so being ready is, is really good to be able to, uh, to catch things that don't last long. Um, Again, close-ups have their place. This one has uh, interesting colored tail. Again, I, I, I would have said a red squirrel, but now I'm not sure. Um, there's a mother muskrat. I, I showed this one last year. I didn't know she was carrying babies until I, I thought she was building a lodge until I got back to, until I got home and then zoomed in. So there she has a, a baby in her mouth. Um, this is just by, just outside Gananoque. Um, here's another example. We were there photographing uh, 
other kinds of birds and then this mink appeared out of nowhere and it went around us. We were in a canoe and it, it wanted to get to its, to its den um, and it swam around us. And that's the only picture I could get. Um, I wasn't set up for it. I had, I had a long lens and all of a sudden it's like two feet from the canoe. So I, I had a hard time getting it at all. And this is the kind of photograph that if I could make more of them, I would. I, I really, my interest in photography, I'm, I'm not a biologist, I'm not a naturalist, I'm not a, not a bird watcher. I like, I like visuals. And this is the kind of photograph that really appeals to me. The color, uh, the, the greens, all the, uh, the ripples in the water. If I could make more photographs like that, that's what I would, that's what I would focus on. I'm trying to, but uh, I'm, so much of it is luck and you increase your luck by being there and being ready. I think that's the end of the, of the collection. Um, yeah, that's it. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Oh, before I do one more thing. This is the little camera I was talking about. This is the power of its zoom. So this is on one of the uh, Rideau, Rideau trails. Handheld is terrible, but that's the way it is. So that's how far that camera will, will get you to. Uh, and if it's on a tripod, that takes amazing photographs, uh, a video, amazing video on, on a tripod. And it's $700, not 7,000. So I will stop sharing and, uh, and we can go from there. I think it's, I'm looking at 45 minutes. Hope we have a little bit of time. Yeah, great. How are we doing? Thank you, Brian. Was any, anybody there still? I don't know. Yeah, still, <laughs> everyone that was here before is still here. Don't worry, okay, well, nobody that's, left. That's good. Um, thanks, Brian. Yeah, yeah, just in reference to that camera you just um, spoke about, there yes. is a question here in the Q&A about a camera you could recommend as a good starter camera, not a cell phone. Preferably under a thousand. So, can you give us a name of that? Camera? That one is that one is a Canon uh, SX sixty. I forget. I think it's SX seventy, SX sixty. It's Canon SX sixty. It's only it's only this big. Oh, nice. With a with a. Uh, What's the zoom like? The zoom a particular lens on it, or is that the one? That no, it's built in, which oh. makes it great for video because you can zoom in and out without trying to do it manually, which ends up shaking the camera. So this one is actually an SX, uh, SX 70. So it's a 70 times zoom. And this is what I use to take the picture of that owl that in the last, the last owl. Um, this is a great camera to get started. Um, camera kinks and those guys there, they know, they know what they're talking about. This is only one, there's a collection of these. I think, I think they're called uh, maybe super telephotos. I'm not sure what the exact name is, Okay. but I see a lot of people, this is all they have. Maybe a better version, like a more expensive version, like a Sony version, but uh, this is all they have. Um, and I keep wondering whether it's all I should have, but I, when I do enlarge them, I realize that the quality that I want is just like that last one I showed of the, of the uh, muskrat in the green water, the reflected green water. Uh, if I wanted to make that large enough for a print, uh, I don't know, I don't know. It, if, it, if it's handheld, then you run the risk of it being, I don't know. I, I, but that's, that's, I would say, I would suggest start looking at those. Mm -hmm. um, and they, yes, and they're, they're, they have so many features that, but that's what I would say to start with. And if, if possible, you can rent. You can, I think, I don't know whether, I don't know whether Camera oh, Kingston okay. rents or not, but uh, there's a place called, I think it's just called Lens Rentals. Um, and the guys in Ottawa rent as well. Um, a, is it a Vista? Uh, that's not the right name. Something like that though. Vista Tech. Vista Tech. Okay. So Great. before, when I bought that big lens, I rented it for three days to make sure that, because I didn't want to spend, I think it was $2,500. I didn't want to spend that kind of money until I knew what it was like for me. Because one person's recommendation may not be good for you. So, right. so I would recommend if you can, um, rent, for a, rent for a day or two and then go out and shoot everything you can think of. That's a good recommendation for sure. Okay. Yeah. Um, so yeah, this is time for more questions. It looks like um, there are several people excited about that camera. Okay. That you recommend. Well, I would, I would, if it were, I, I shop a lot. Like I, in terms of, I do a lot of research. That right. was the best one for me at the time. It's mm -hmm. two years old. Things change so fast in the camera world. I wouldn't say that's the best of that of that class, but look at that and then look at his competitors. Okay. And there's a site called uh, there's a site called DP Review, digital okay. photograph DPReview.com. They review every camera, and you can do side, but you can make a, 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 a t tables and compare. Like put put five cameras and see how they're all different or the same. DPReview.com. 
is is a quick way to and they're not selling anything so they're they they uh they review them based on the uh the, their merits so. right excellent yeah. um so there is there's another question here yep. have you um ever explored underwater photography i have not i have not but i was talking about it recently it it doesn't appeal to me personally because i i i, I don't i like to be able to breathe <laughs> Uh, no, so I've never done any any spelunking in caves, um, and I don't have I have no experience with underwater, but I haven't tried it. And I possibly uh, people have said if you did some uh, scuba photography. But speaking of underwater photography, if anybody, if you have not seen uh, my octopus teacher, that is a film that is worth watching. And a guy goes out and and films an octopus every day for I don't know how long. It is a stunning piece of cinematography. My octopus teacher. It was on Netflix. I don't know now, but if you want to be inspired by underwater photography, that's a film. And there's a story to it as well. So it's my octopus teacher. It's great. <laughs> Excellent. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so there's, uh, I, I agree with you. I mean, I think I share your aesthetic about the really <laughs> interesting backgrounds. And I really loved some of the photographs you had of that you can really see the animal's personality. Like you can almost yeah. see their eyes and with their tongue sticking out. And it was, it's super interesting to see up close. It's, and, uh, and when you isolate the animal by itself, they all look the same. If you go on the internet and type in porcupine, you'll find 10,000 amazing photographs of close-ups of porcupines. And we all know what they look like. Uh, so when you can, but it's the temptation, you've, I have to actually remember to stand back or zoom out and say, okay, don't forget to photograph where it is. Because the first thing you do is you, and if you got a long lens, that's what you do. You pull up this long lens and then you're already, everything's cropped out. So I have to, I, I always carry, well, I'm embarrassed. I always, I usually have five cameras on me for different things. <laughs> They're not all big ones, but I do have, yeah, have them. Because I found over time that swapping lenses is just not viable. It's just not, you're just not going to do it. And it's not good for the equipment either to take a big lens off and then put oh, another I, one on you, it. You so I ended up, so I ended up buying two on. bodies. So I have one with the zoom lens on it. And then I have another one that has a, a sort of a much more moderate so I can do the, uh, the shot with the environment. So that's interesting that you have these different photographs of like by the road um, or sort of out more in the wilderness. Um, do you find, and you were talking about the difference between birds and animal photographs. So do you find um, that you have to kind of go far uh, away from roads and civilizations or? Um, not so much. It's a, it really, to me, it really is a game of, of, of chance. And the only way you can increase your chances is by going when the, going often and going when there's a greater likelihood that they'll be out early morning. Animals are typically active. You seldom see a moose in, in Algonquin, but in the morning, if you do see one, you'll see them in the morning and the evening, but typically in the morning. So you can increase your chances, but I think, I don't think I have any of those photographs I showed today that I went to, to went specifically to photograph whatever it was. I happened to be <laughs> okay. there, happened to be there uh, yeah. and, was, and was ready, but uh, I, the anteater, we specifically went looking for it. We, we decided something we'd never done before. We thought rather than hire a guide, let's just make it a, a mission. We, we'll spend four days and go out four days in a row and do nothing but look for anteaters. <laughs> and we found one on this on the second. Well, Alana found it, I didn't find it. So we found four of them. But that's the only time that, that I can think of that we've gone specifically um, to once, for example, in Algonquin, uh, bears like uh, the hydro lines, the power lines, because all because the vegetation's all gone. So we went and we saw them once in Algonquin by the hydro lines. So we went back to the same place and they were there again. Um, right, and I but, and I think some some people because also the berries grow there too sometimes. The right. Berries. Yes. Yes. Exactly. But yeah. the there that relates to a question here um, in the Q and A. Do you primarily stalk when looking for good photos, or do you set up in a good likely spot in hopes? of sitting still. I do both. I do both. Some of, okay. some of my better photographs have been by accident. For example, the, uh, uh, I wouldn't say it was a great, but the mink, the mink, I was there photographing falcons. Um, the muskrat carrying the babies, I was there photographing Virginia rail. And I saw this <laughs> thing going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. 
um, but I will oftentimes I will <laughs> it sounds kind of silly but I'll stand with a light scoot <laughs> for birds anyways and hope that something comes in and some once in a while they do I don't have a problem sitting for an hour or two hours um, and you'd be surprised how things change after about 20 minutes things mm -hmm. that, that that left because they don't go far they just go away from you so if you can sit uh, quietly uh, Lana was in um, that's very good practice. Sit. Lana quietly. was in Lana was in Blue Mountain, and we've been to this, this. Actually, there was a picture of her sitting with her binoculars. She was sitting. We've been there many times, and she saw some otter in that pond or that part of the lake, and decided to just sit there. She sat there and sat there, and they came up almost right to her. They didn't know she was there. They they popped up like they do with their heads, and they looked at her and that oh, and they took off again. But that was just from sitting on the off chance that they come, and they did. And so. So I think, did I answer the question? Um, you did, you did. Yeah, I, but I yeah. do oftentimes will a bird to come into a nice setting. <laughs> Sometimes. So what did you say you, you set up with a what? I didn't get that word. Just now? Well, you said something where you set up with something for a bird to come to? Um, well, I said I, I will them to come. I, I set oh, up. You will them to come. I will okay. them to come. You will come. I'm, I'm set up. The oh, light, is, the light okay. is beautiful. The branch is great. You know, it's okay. an autumn color. I want to now a blue jay to land on these leaves. <laughs> and okay, once a in a while, of... once in a while they do, right? But nice. uh, but it's not a game for people who are in a hurry. And I've also discovered yeah. that it's hard to mix the two uh, in terms if you're going for a hike or you're going to photograph. Right. Um, they're different. And I, for, for a long time, tried to combine them together, but it ends up being not much of either. So it's better to decide, okay, I'm going to go to photograph and I'm only going to walk whatever, 3K, 4K, and I'll stay in one place for 15 minutes or I'm going to go walk for, I'm going to go for a 10K walk. Yeah, and if I see fun. something, what, fine. We have another question here. Mm -hmm. um, how many cameras do you have? Oh, just the ones I mentioned. I have, I have, I don't have, well, I have, I have this one that I showed earlier. I have this one. My, my, my big lens is in for repairs, so I haven't taken many pictures this year. This is the second body that I use for, and I have this one that I use primarily. It has a macro lens on it for, for, for uh, insects and flowers. And then I have this little guy that is another awesome, it's a little Sony, but it is just a crazy good, but again, it's, it's uh, $1,600 for that little thing. But the quality of it is, is outstanding. It's what, it's what professional photographers carry. So they have something in their pocket that will take uh, really good photographs. And then my phone. So I can easily have all five of those with me on any given, on any given walk, um, any given hike. And I'm looking to change. Uh, these are 10 year old cameras. They were, the cameras were $1,600 and $2,000 10 years ago. They've, they've served me well. The technology has moved on and digital cameras, I mean, not digital, but uh, mic uh, mirrorless cameras now offer much better quality and features um, at and much, much lighter. And they even okay. have, uh, yeah. they have some zoom lenses now that weigh a third that now they're, and yeah, the, the Canon has a couple of new zoom lenses that are under thousand dollars. Before they were $12,000. Wow, yeah. So the things are moving along. Down. Yeah. 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 So um, there's a couple other comments about yep. mosquitoes and things. Um, yeah. Two, two last questions and then we'll finish up. I think yep. the photograph specifically of the owl, um, wondering what time of day it was because um, we were thinking that it was nocturnal, so. Uh, bar barred owls, well, yeah, they're often in the trees. I mean, they're resting. Um, oh, okay. They, 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 they hunt, they're nocturnal in the sense that they hunt at night. But they, but they're they're there resting, and they might move from branch to branch. Barred owls are, are the easiest to see around here. Uh, they're, they're large for one thing, okay, and they're quite great. plentiful. They're, but but in the area we have screech owls, we have great horned owls, but uh, not in the same abundance as the others. So yes, they hunt at night. Um, yeah, that but makes they, sense. But they roost in the day, and, and if you've got somebody with good eyes, I don't. Then <laughs> I think I've seen one owl on my own. <laughs> Not good eyes, but good cameras. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Yeah, what I make up for. Yeah, good camera. Um, and the last question yep. before we close off is, do you submit your photographs anywhere like for identification? So if you see something you don't know what it is, do you? Um, I have done. Um, iNaturalist is the best app for that. Uh, I've done that with 
I don't know butterflies. I don't really know flowers. Um, I might put those chipmunks up or the squirrels because I'd be curious to see what they are. I had no idea we had 22 species. Um, and once in a while we'll put, um, because Lana is, is, is very adept at identifying birds, we seldom go beyond that. But we have put some up uh, that are that are confusing. And sometimes the image, I didn't really realize it, but oftentimes the picture is not enough. It depends on, on the sound, depends on the behavior, depends on the environment. So even an expert uh, can't always tell one, one species from another just by the... So I don't know how you could identify the head of a beaver from the head of a, of a muskrat, but there probably is a way, I don't know it. Tail, the tail is the giveaway. Right. So. Right. Well, thank you so much, Brian. My pleasure. Happy to do it. Your time to share yeah. your photographs and your stories, and maybe next year it'll be mushrooms and insects and flowers. <laughs> oh yeah, those are those are incredible. We're not done yet. <laughs> and they stay yeah. still. They stay right? still. They the stay still. I don't need. I don't need a guide for that. Yeah, maybe not the insects. That's um, Brian, before we close, and I know yeah. Rosie has a couple of things to say. Yeah. You mentioned iNaturalist, and we started the day with um, a discussion about using iNaturalist for the BioBlitz between now and the end of July. Okay. So I would urge you, beg you, okay. ask you, tempt you to um, join our project. So since okay. you already have an iNaturalist account, all you have to do is go to the community tab on inaturalist.ca and drag down to projects and search Wintergreen Studios. And okay. the project for this year is called, are you ready? Wait for ready. it. I'm ready. Wintergreen Studios BioBlitz 2021. Oh, that's, what my, that's what my files are called. <laughs> there you go. So if you just, um, even if you just search Wintergreen Studios, you'll find it. And okay. all of the observations that you've made in this area since March, okay. we have a time and a geography constraint okay. on it. They all pop up. And okay. it would be wonderful to have some of these photos on our project for this year. Okay. And any of the rest of you who've just joined us for the first time today um, or didn't see the beginning presentation that I gave, which was awful because the internet <laughs> kept dying, oh, no. um, feel free to join our project. And again, it's Wintergreen Studios BioBlitz 2021. So and thank next you. year we'll be live, right? Next year, uh, honestly, <laughs> yes. I'm going we'll to just go do it, right we'll just out do there it anyway. Today. We'll all get vaccinated and do it anyways. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, and so I'm actually going to jump in here and just share my screen to say that this is the last session that we have for the day today. But um, there are many more activities on the Wintergreen website. So these are some curated classrooms, curriculum activities that can be used uh, on different topics, green energy and pollinators, etc. And we also have some land art and outdoor activities, self-guided hikes that uh, you can download activities here. And as you'll see, there is there are links to the project that Rena was just talking about. So if you need more information, that's there. And then we are still tentatively hoping that we may be able to welcome people up for an in-person family day to Wintergreen on June 19th. So it is free and it is rain or shine. So we're waiting only for the province to give us the go ahead. So you can register here on this button to let us know that you would be interested in coming up. Uh, so we know who to expect if we are given the go ahead. So I'll stop sharing now and I'll say thank you so much to Brian and to Rena and Monica for the lovely day. And I've learned so much <laughs> from everyone. And thanks for all the participants who came. There will be a short four question survey at the end of this webinar when you click off, it should come up in your browser. So it would be really appreciated if you would put some of your thoughts in there. So thanks everyone. Any other closing thoughts, Rena and Monica? Okay, lovely. Thank you so much. Take care everyone. Bye.